Good morning. Today is the 25th of January, 2018, and I'm Jim Buholz, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum. As part of the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews with veterans and civilians who have participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today, I'm here at the museum with Frank Pagano. Frank is also accompanied by his uh, daughter. Uh, Frank was a staff sergeant uh, in the Air Force uh, during World War II who flew out of uh, Fogia. He was a tail gunner and, and uh, ball turret gunner in a B-17. Oh. Frank, it's a pleasure to have you with us here today. Frank, can you spell your full name for me? Yeah, Francis, F-R-A-N-C-I-S, A. Pagano, P -A -N -G Paul A G A N O. And when and where were you born? I was born in Highland Park, Michigan, in uh, 1925. And that would make you 92. 92 <laughs> years of age today. Yeah. Well, how big a town uh, was your hometown? Well, I lived primarily in the atmosphere of Detroit, Michigan, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where I grew up. And then would finally get into the service to finally find out what's going on outside in the outside world. You're very limited in your experiences. Being today and that time, the ability to travel and do things were very limited. And I grew up. I had a older brother and a twin brother. And uh, twin brother. Yeah. And what he. Uh, we both uh, uh, applied for and took testing for Navy B-12, and uh, they took him. They wouldn't take me as a candidate because uh, the Sullivan brothers and their incident, my brothers lost on one of their one of their ships, and uh, they, so they didn't lean towards accepting brothers as a, as a as a group. As a group in the same unit. So and, yeah, so I turned around and enlisted in the Air Force and and joined the cadet program. And uh, before we go on to that, tell me a little bit about your growing up in Michigan. What did your father do? My dad worked in the Postal Service primarily. He had other experiences and he was also a World War I veteran. And uh, being, uh, he immigrated to this country with his father uh, early on back in the 1900s. And uh, they had to revet him because of, he had an Italian ancestry mm -hmm. and when you relate to vetting people today and everybody got all worked up about immigration and all that stuff and when, when he had to go through and re-identify and almost become a, a, a certified citizen again to mm -hmm. be in the be in the service for his country in the infantry and he served in france okay so he was he was a native italian right and that makes you first generation right. italian Okay. Was there a community of Italian folks in the area where you live? Oh yeah, I think there, you saw a lot of mixture of people, Irish, Italian, and I think they assimilated a lot better in, a, in terms of living together as a group. And you had, typically, I think in the area of Detroit, you had various groups mm -hmm. of people in different nationalities. And uh, even then, there was uh, the fact that you were a foreigner, supposedly. You had that onus associated with it. Mm -hmm. My mother was a French war bride. My dad married her during the service in France. And uh, after the war ended, they stayed there and and ran the on a contract basis the post office in France. And mm -hmm. they stayed over there and married my mother. And she became she was a French war bride. So I have my uh, parentage. I'm French Italian technically. So that's the way it. And and what town in in Italy was your father? From. Well, I've tried, uh, I think they identified with uh, the Rome in the area near Rome, Italy. And because uh, when I served, I went into Naples and then on to Foggia. And uh, so I didn't have any stories to identify with uh, related to his area of where he, he was born or where he grew up. But uh, it was an uh, experience. I wish I knew more Italian, but I didn't. My dad wanted me to be brought up speaking fluent English and not to be bilingual in any way. So, and what about your mother? What, what area of France was she from? She was from Brest, France. Brest. The western part of France. And, uh, yeah, Finisterre. They, they're different names or identify with locality. And, uh, but uh, her, her dad was uh, 
also in the military in France. And uh, I think his name was Victor, and we got the names passed on. My twin brother was named Victor. And how I got Francis, I think it was from Francis Scott Key. Mm -hmm. uh, so we inherited certainly my middle name. I don't know where that came from, Adrian. And what, what branch was your father in the Army? He was in the infantry. Infantry? AEF. I, I I'm trying to think of the Army of Expeditionary Force, AEF, I think is what AEF. they called it. Did he ever talk to you about his war? Oh, yeah, war he, had, he was exposed to gas, and he, he suffered from that a little bit when he came back. And I, he didn't talk too much. He talked about some mean Army sergeants that they had, which mm -hmm. was, didn't relate. So he much. was in trench warfare? I, that's the impression I got. Never talked too much about it. Okay. And they just accepted what he did and what he, what he experienced. Uh, did you go to public school in Michigan? I did, and went, uh, I went to Custer Grade School and then uh, on to uh, the uh, intermediate school. And then I went to Catholic High School, which was a wonderful. We went, I think I spent, uh, I used to tell people I spent 10 hours a day and we took three buses to get there. It was downtown Detroit. Probably the best uh, uh, technical school you could go to. I studied aeronautical engineering. You could study architecture. I had better math. I studied, I had advanced math. Hmm. I had advanced Alabama. And then when I went on to school at General Motors Institute, well, I was two, two math courses ahead of everybody. And I had better mechanical engineering and drawing. I had more experience there. Well, back then you would go out and get a job from technical school. Mm -hmm. And I had metallurgy that, and other courses I had couldn't even be compared to what I had in, uh, in, uh, in the schooling when I got at General Motors. Now, if you had a twin brother, he probably was with you through all this. Well, he, he, he went on, we have separated. Technically, when he got into the service and in my service, we kind of went our but he was ways. together with you during your grade school, middle school, oh, yeah. high school Oh yeah, we were just, in fact, when the tests that we had in high school, the guy said, well, man, they both got the same things wrong. I said, well, let's <laughs> we study together. What, what, what did you expect? Were you identical twins? or We found out later they ran studies out of U of M and study of twins. Mm -hmm. And through the twin study, they finally identified the fact that we were identical. And so we were, so in a lot of ways, but the fact we lived physically, he's experienced different problems and handled them differently than myself. He's still with me, but he lives in uh, North Florida now. He got remarried again when he was 85. Lost Wonderful. his wife early on, and maybe 10 years before that, and then uh, got remarried. And I wondered whether that was a thing he should do, but it was the right. We finally met his new, new wife, and she's a wonderful woman. So I'm happy for him in that respect. Did you, aside from getting a great education, did you play any sports or have any well, outside activities? Well, I wasn't a sport guy. My, I wasn't into my my twin brother was played baseball. He caught. He played baseball with in Cavs Tech, mm -hmm. and more sports oriented than I was. I didn't. I more in the art aspect of life and dealt with that in a different way. I could beat him wrestling, but in the area of boxing, he fought in the Navy when he was wow. in the Navy, he got golden gloves. So what year did you graduate from high school? 43, 1943 in June. So you must have some fairly vivid recollections of uh, the bombing at Pearl Harbor. Tell us oh, about yeah, that. Oh yeah, yeah, well, I think everybody, uh, even with my older brother who enlisted in the infantry, in the Army, and uh, I think after that he went in, oh, shortly after Pearl Harbor. And uh, we, granted, when you talk about 1943, and uh, that, I think the fact that uh, everybody identified with you know, what happened in 41, and uh, I think there was a lot more uh, uh, identification with the effort and being part of what was going on and joining the service, which seemed like something everybody had to do at that certain age. Would and, you call it teamwork? Yeah, there was uh, that aspect of uh, identifying with uh, your country and what you could do, and maybe it was more youth-oriented, kind of an idealistic association. Mm -hmm. Once you got in there, I guess you figured, you know, how and why, but you were there and <laughs> you were Once doing you got it. in, you tried to figure out how you were going to get out. <laughs> well, you're, you're trying to relate to 
after things were going on, when after I came back, they wanted to, to uh, uh, assign yourself to maybe join in uh, uh, working with, on B-29s mm -hmm. and get with a fly in the Pacific, and I, I didn't have any desire to do that. I, d I did my thing, and I figured you, you, you matured very quickly from your experience and identified mm -hmm. with a different meaning and you weren't uh, so fatalistic about things and relates related to the real world a little bit better. And you were you were you were more of an observer when you first got there and mm -hmm. identify with it. But I think the experience helped the growing up part of it. I think if I didn't have that, I would have a different view of life and what I had what I had ahead of me and what I had to do. I think you had more of a commitment to marriage. You had a different commitment towards your job and trying to succeed in life. And I think part of it is the way I grew up. My dad was very focused on working with us and when we did homework, he was there. He helped us do things and gave us a different view on everything that we dealt with. And uh, that you felt uh, that you could rely on your parents a little bit more. Today you'd see things that's a whole different world. I think with the idea of uh, electronic communication in life and doing sharing personal things with people that you had no idea what was going on. I don't think, even today, I resist that aspect of what mm -hmm. people have to deal with in life. It's a different, different world, a different world. Well, it sounds, like, it sounds like you come from that generation that when challenged, did their best to meet the challenge. That's exactly right, exactly, yeah. A lot of people lay back and you had to go do something. Or go. let somebody else do it. Right. Yeah, and it didn't work that way for me. Okay, when you graduated from high school, did you enlist immediately, or? Well, yeah, I think after my brother uh, was accepted, and he would, he'd left early, he was still 17. And uh, I figured that I, my mom was with me, we took a bus to Selfridge Field, and that's where I enlisted in, in the Air Cadet program. And, uh, I, I'd washed out of that very quickly. They needed gunners more, and buddies of mine went in earlier. They had this, they called it a stay nine score system. And if you were, nine was the top number, or 10. And if you could score a seven, you, you would qualify. And then they'd change the number real quick. And I figured I'd at least maybe qualify for a bomber, for a bombardier or navigator, but and, uh, they, you knew you were heading for gunnery school. Okay, you grew up in the Detroit area. How close was uh, your home to Willow Run? Uh, we were, uh, in fact, uh, I know they had the B-24 Ford Motor built up. And I started school with GM with Fisher Body. And then they were in the, we were, they were building parts for the B-25. So we weren't, when I joined them, we weren't making cars or, car, or automotive bodies, mm -hmm. they were building uh, components for the B-25. How aware were you at that time of what was going on at Well Run in other production areas around the Detroit region during the war? Well, that awareness, I think, was there, but I think it wasn't uh, something I focused on. And I think even I met people when I started working more, when I got to work with Ford Motor Company, mm -hmm. and I realized the role that they played in the building the B-24s. And, uh, and a lot of the people that I met, some of the managers were guys that, when, when, a lot of them were uh, German ancestry, and they worked within the B-24 program and management in the B-24s. So and a lot of them came back when they started in the Ford Motor and Automotive, then you're running into the aircraft types. Mm -hmm. But the aircraft experience was good for me because you learned a little bit more about the similar metals mm -hmm. and, and you brought it into the work that you had when you worked in with uh, in the Ford uh, automotive program. But see, with Fisher Body, that program, they focused on building bodies only. And then when the when you went to the division, like Chevrolet or Pontiac, then the body building portion was Fisher, which is a separate entity. Mm -hmm. And then they, when they built the body, they shoved them through the door, went to Chevrolet. And then one of the, my fifth year program at uh, General Motors, when I, Fisher Body, was a study of our Fisher body quality, because the division people, the Chevrolet support, they didn't, they figured the quality wasn't up to snuff 
from Fisher Body, but I was, I had a great fifth year with them. And uh, I, after I graduated my four year program, the fifth year was a special project. And I had the project of running a study of over 100 Fisher Bodies in two different divisions at Lansing with the Oldsmobile, and then the other body program was Civil A. And they, they're considered A and B body types. So depending on the product they built, they went A, B, C. The C body was a Cadillac size, bigger bodies, and they were sad. But, uh, but from that study, I ended up with a book like that, went into their library, and I was supposed to give a uh, presentation of what I did at uh, AFC. And uh, when, uh, when I went back, after I finished the fifth year, they put me on the board working on convertible programs and doing menial job, I could do design work. So this was after the war? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, one question I wanted to ask you, uh, as a Italian first generation, did you experience any prejudice because the Italians were on the other side? Or did you see prejudice uh, exhibited toward uh, uh, first generation Germans? Well, I think during your growing up I think my dad experienced that more than I did. And I'll, all I know, when I grew up, the name Pagano was very limited. I think somebody within the Union work area in Detroit, they identified Union people named Pagano. But, uh, but when I got into service, every other guy I knew knew a Pagano. <laughs> so it became like Smith. So there were a lot more Paganos in the world. In fact, I got a letter when I was overseas, and uh, one of the, within that 463rd book that I got into the history, of the squadron, and that same group that I was in before me was a, a guy by the name of Pagano, and his name was Aaron. I thought it was that I was being identified. With. I thought, no, this was different. And I got a piece of mail that meant from he came out of uh, Washington, uh, Washington area, and uh, I almost opened it. It wasn't mine. It had the different serial number. I said, that's not for me. Sort of identify with another Pagano that was over there. So the that's a fairly common Italian name. But it became it became more common than uh, I could even identify with, and what my my parents had done experience. And my dad was very into. But he was very uh, detailed man. He could he uh, played. He was into music, and very book well read. Well, uh, he read a lot of books and very detailed and. A uh, very intelligent man, self Sort of a renaissance man. Yeah, a very intelligent individual, very well read. Read books and marked books and you could, I had books in his he wrote in the, in, you know, on the side of the pages and identified and explained things and very, and I think a lot of that rubbed off on me too. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like he set a standard that you lived up to. That's right. That's right. All right, tell me about that specific time between high school and the time you enlisted in the military in some of your early training experiences uh, in the Army Air Force. Well, I think uh, when, I, when I left high school and, then, and I joined, when I got into the military, uh, the, uh, I think the fact that uh, I had the early schooling that helped you in your ability to focus on what they were uh, training. And when we, get, when we got into uh, Las Vegas, they had a very rigid day-to-day -day program and experience you had, and you had to uh, subscribe to that. A lot of it, most, a lot of it was up mm -hmm. in the air. A lot of ground training, especially when you. Uh, we went through uh, stages of uh, learning how to deal with uh, firing weapons. We were. They had uh, the, the, like a skeet shooting range. We started with that. Then it was got in the back end of a truck, mm -hmm. and they had these little uh, out these houses would shoot the clay pigeons out in different directions, and from the back of a truck, you're learning how to maneuver and... and, and so and, you're moving, the target's moving, right. it just like and simulates was, what would be And I guess as a young, it was a lot of fun. So, mm -hmm. And then when they went into stationary, we got into fixed uh, turret arrangements. And the weapons wasn't, they weren't 50 calibers. They were probably maybe uh, 30 caliber weapons within these targets. And you learn how to operate the turrets and, and gun sight and targets. Was this part of your basic training 
in gunnery school. In gunnery school, but, it's, but you had to have basic. Yeah, we went school. basic, and we weren't. Uh, when I first be, was still part of the cadet program, mm -hmm. as a cadet, then we were down in Florida, and uh, and we went through the basic training, infantry training. We went on marches and all that. And uh, did, down did you there, take, you couldn't you hang out. Tests? Your Pardon? You take tests. Uh, there was a basic uh, testing. Yeah, we went through testing, and that was part of the, that made uh, established the direction you had, whether you're on to future flight training. And we went probably went to Texas from there, and then the fact that the, I you were disqualified early enough in the program. And then you took a new direction to gunnery school. You, you hopped on trains. You didn't fly anywhere. Okay, you first got together with what subsequently became your crew in Memphis. Where were the people from that were in your crew? All over the country? Oh, yeah. You had uh, the pilot, uh, was Dick Holmes, and uh, then the co-pilot was uh, uh, Jack Robinson. And uh, he was from uh, California. Holmes was, I think, from Massachusetts. And the... Uh, Radio operator was from Ohio, and uh, that was uh, Eugene Gamble, and then the uh, Baltimore gunner was James Mulrain, and he was from, uh, I think, uh, New Hampshire, from New England area, and then the uh, waste gunner uh, was uh, two of them, uh, Olman, he was from California, and McGowan, James McGowan, he was from uh, California as well. And then the uh, altar gunner was James Mulrain, and he was from uh, Massachusetts. So it really was a, a mixed, yeah, very the, eclectic the, group of people. Yeah, the bombardier and the navigator were from the uh, New York area, Connecticut and New York. And there were, uh, it would be, uh, I had, uh, well, the heck, you have, uh, I should know their name, Snyder was the uh, bombardier. And, and, and Albert was the... Uh, How long were you together with that group? Well, we we uh, technically we thought we were going to fly together all the time, but they needed to establish crew staffing within the aircraft. And uh, even the homes, the pilot had to fly co-pilot until they would establish him as a pilot. And the same thing for each... They almost had to qualify again Mm -hmm. to be able to fit the positions. But when we were training, they were flying as pilot and co-pilot and all of that. But the so that, were... that initial assignment to crew was not a permanent arrangement at all? No, no. It, it, I didn't realize. I, f I almost felt that we were going to be flying together. And uh, it never, I think we did maybe, I think, I think within my diary identified with that mixture. And that's why I ended up flying the ball. Couple, I didn't expect that. I'd look up on the board and figure with the position they were flying. I said, "What? You know, what's going on?" But that's what the name of the game was. And then, so tell me about the things that you did when you were in the process of training in Memphis, and shortly thereafter, they gave you the qualifications to really become a ball turret gunner as well as a tail gunner. What well, kind of things did you have to do in the air and? Well, on the ground. When, well, when we were flying in the training as a group, and they we would fly over a, a river area, and, and we actually fire our guns at targets, and even in gunnery school we flew, and the, uh, the they had women pilots who were flying B B twenty sixes with with a with a, a tail target they had and a uh, would be like a, a long canvas target behind the mm -hmm. aircraft. And then you would have uh, marked ammunition that uh, uh, would be uh, able to identify with your shooting capability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, we flew, that's an air-to-air kind of uh, weapon experience. And then we, again, when we flew, uh, a lot of the targets were shooting uh, along the targets along the river. Mm -hmm. And some of these yo-yos would be out there fishing. And where there were people that were, shouldn't be in in that area, and, and uh, it almost became uh, a game when you identified with what uh, what you had to do when you're doing ground firing. Instead of when when we were in gunnery school, we did more air to air kind of missions. But mm -hmm. uh, some of it was uh, you're, you're 
you did more firing, I think, weapons in gunner school than we when, when we ended up flying during the war. Mm -hmm. We didn't have too many enemy aircraft to deal with. Our biggest worry was flying over a target and uh, dealing with uh, being like a sitting duck and uh, being shot at by artillery. And uh, that was the biggest worry for us. Mm -hmm. and we did test firing, but a lot of people asked me, well, how much did you? I said, no. I said, I could see and identify with aircraft and uh, F tails. Flew on F tails. I don't remember flying in that beautiful scenic. <laughs> <Rear view. laughs> I never, I never yeah, flew on it. My mind was that big. Yeah, I had to, had to wipe it off with alcohol to keep it. But it, over. but, but it had a chin turret. Your, your. It had a chin. It was a modified G. Modified G. F tail. I'll be darned. And that's all I flew in, even in gun. Yeah. Yeah. It was. I think that's the thing that uh, you try to identify with. I went back here, look at it, I didn't fly that. And then I tried it in my, I kept a diary and I said, an identifier, I said, a modified G. Mm -hmm. That's oh, what yeah. it was. Yeah. Because well, I know in gunnery school, the pictures I had with a, with a chin to it. And uh, it's a F, you know, G and I flew on the F with an F tail. <laughs> So, I had not heard of that, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. you try to put you together, looked, I said, man, this doesn't that, match, huh? Have you looked in this uh, <laughs> tail gunner door? <laughs> yeah, I looked in there. I mean, today. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, no, I did Well, let us walk over and take yeah. a look at it, and but let's talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty much stripped down. Yeah. Compared to, well, I, in the ball tour, I flew that a couple of times. They didn't keep us as a crew all the time. They broke us up depending on what they needed. Yeah. What, what years... Uh, were, were you were you on these missions? I went in, time started in, in forty in forty four in October, the end of October into November. And how many? And then I flew forty three. But uh, tell us a little bit about the ball turret. Uh, yeah, uh, how would how the bombs when they dropped out of the bomb bay, which was very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Watch that happen. Oh, but yeah. I got in there with a chest pack. I wouldn't fly without a parachute in that damn thing. Uh -huh. And I got in there. With, I only weighed 130 pounds, mm -hmm. yeah. and we got in that thing from the inside. Right. And they got put the turret down, and that door would be upside and in mm -hmm. from the top of the side of the aircraft. And then you always had that when you bailed out, your, the guns when they go up this way, then the door is exposed. And I always knew how to get out. You roll out, you pop the door off, and roll out back. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't get into it unless it was in the air, correct? Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. A lot of guys because it would, it would flip up and you would yeah. drop down into it, and you have your your feet would be yeah kind of well your seat would kind of be against that where it says caution over there. Correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to my memory unless I got in well, there. Yeah. Well, let's come over here for a second because we have a little picture here. <laughs> that kind of shows. Yeah. Is that kind of what you remember oh, yeah, it being yeah, like that? Yeah. 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 And I had a, I had a chest pack on. Yeah. And you wouldn't figure there'd be room in front of you the way that was set up. So your handles to shoot the gun, or shoot the your machine gun was up above you, kind of it yeah. looks like. Yeah, yeah. And that, it, but that was a control too. You were able to you could to m maneuver the turret. Uh huh. I fell asleep in the thing. <laughs> My guns were turned on, and then some one of the other people in the adjoining aircraft said. Hey, Dick, what the hell's going on? They got guns pointed at, the, at our ship. And I said, so they called me down there and I had fall, fallen asleep. Oh, I went some of the missions in nine hours. You know? Yeah. So that's the whole thing. But you try to remember that. The best view I had when I yeah. flew the tail, you always saw the bombs after they hit the ground. This one, you can see them coming out of the bomb bay. Wow. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. when you think back, I've got a very detailed diary. Yeah. Without that, my memory would be very limited, believe me. Could you hear the bombs as they went by, yeah. uh, as they uh, um, went out? Uh, you they, couldn't hear anything. With, uh, everybody in the crew, the bombardier had uh, a job to do. He had to, had to get the pins out of the bombs. He had a big cable. Oh. He'd get in by the bomb bay and pull the and, and almost uh, the, all the bombs were armed. Mm -hmm. And then they pulled the pins on the bombs, and they had veins on the front. Mm -hmm. So yeah. unless those pins were pulled, then the bombs wouldn't even react. Because as the bombs fall, it unwinds, and the bomb gets armed on the way down. So he, that was his job. There were a lot yeah. of different jobs. Then they had chaff. 
I don't know where they have chaff oak trees on the back here. I don't know. Did you ever fire, fire your guns in anger? <laughs> no, we, we test fired. But, uh -huh. you know, we had great, uh, uh, we had, uh, as far as the support from the, uh, the aircraft we had, a lot of the guys were the red tails. The P-51s? Yeah, oh. mostly, and we had P-38s initially. But they had range that take us to the initial point, mm -hmm. and they be with us all the time. We'd get off the target, and they'd be waiting for us and take us back. Did you, did Where you were fly you? out of Italy? Yeah. Yeah. Foggia. Foggia? Yeah. Foggia, yeah. 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 But it's, you know, you try to relate to the... Uh, I, I don't think I could see aircraft fighters or German, mm -hmm. but they never got in close. Even saw some of the... You can tell from the... Uh, on the ME 262 of the new ones, and you can see the double uh, uh, exhaust on the aircraft, and you knew what was out there. But we never had any problems, thank God. Yeah. But it never fired. A lot of people said, How much ammo did you shoot? The only time we did it was test fire. We test fired the guns. Yeah. And I had one gun that went out, and I've repaired it in, at 25, 30,000 feet. Then you wonder why the training you got. Mm -hmm. You could do it with your gloves on. So, oh, so wow. the, the air uh, support that you had was so good oh, yeah, that you never had to fire at a German aircraft. No. That's amazing. <laughs> but the flak was bad enough. Flak yeah, was that's oh, enough. Yeah. It felt like yeah. a goddamn sitting duck. Yeah. And that was the thing that when you're young and stupid, you know, you don't even thought you were there watching a movie. Yeah. Yeah, it would just. You don't know what you don't know. You are God. You got it. <laughs> well, let's go back to uh, here. So. See, this is how, ultra modern. I never flew. So how how was it different? How was your? Oh, you just, I think you had the one model up there. It shows you how narrow it is. Uh huh. I never had a view like this. Yeah. And the other one, it just just, just a cut little. off. And probably no more than that. And you had a little side window, mm -hmm. and you could hardly it was that thick. They would freeze over. And this thing had this one had uh, like heater ducts. Yeah. I think in here to keep keep that window area clean. This would be like from <laughs> Did, night and day compared to what I had. Yeah. Was now, there what, any armor in this damn thing, huh? Was there any, any armor plating back oh, here? Oh yeah, you had it on the sides and you were sitting on armor too. Oh, okay. And this buddy of mine I went to gunnery school with in 88 went right through him. Well, oh. killed him. Oh. What, uh, what kind of a sight did you have back here? A sight when you were... Oh, the, the gun sights? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, you had the same, you didn't have this, uh, this seemed to be a, uh, well, never, this is so sophisticated, never had this at all. Yeah. And that, all you had to do, because you only had, your, your, your field was probably 30 degrees. Yeah. You had a little window up in here. Mine was way back. Yeah. I, I think you, you have an aircraft model over there which showed up. The design of the window. But we never. This is like super modern. And what was the purpose of this window? Well, I I don't know whether I had this. One. I never had that. Yeah. And it, your your guns would go up and down, but they very do, little, very little, but, but maybe but, a, but not to the side yeah, at all. Maybe about maybe th maybe thirty degrees. Yeah. Or about the same way, maybe not even forty-five either direction. Mm -hmm. No, more straight, straight back. And, how, and you the guys in the waist had more. They had the gun sight. And right. Really, mm -hmm, you know, get, get ahead Follow of the, the aircraft. aircraft. Yeah. Get, get ahead of it. This one I had, not just shoot quick, straight back. Yeah. I didn't have a problem, but in the ball you had to do some a little more mechanics. Mm -hmm. trying to do you shoot think it. you could? Could you walk up those stairs there? Those three steps? You think? Over here. Yeah. I remember I always figured out how it'd bail out. <laughs> no, when I when I tried to relate to this thing, it seemed so much bigger than. <laughs> Jim, why don't you get up? Oh, 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 let Jim go up first. Why don't you get up in and kind of help him help him in there, Jim? Low bridge here. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was younger, this seemed like very roomy compared to what I had. I had to get over this. Yeah, this big fan. Yeah, yeah. We used to, I used to walk over here. Get in the tail. Yeah, everybody got in the, in the radio room to be able to take off. Everybody got in the... 
Oh, right. So even, the, the, even, oh, that even right? the tail gunner got in. Oh yeah. Yeah. Everybody oh. before we took everybody was the in the radar room. The and we took off and then they went into your different crew positions. Well, let's we walk, had, let's we walk had up little, the, oh, that way. We had a, uh, yeah. No, go ahead. You're good. Just to stay here for right now. If, sure. Why don't you have a seat there? Okay. Young man. Okay. So you went into the radio room, which is back behind where Jim is. Yeah, there. the whole crew. The yeah. whole crew got in there, yeah. yeah. And then what would you be doing in it? Just talking about the mission or what? Well, we're just sitting there and have to taxi and then take off. And it's always not very quick. Yeah. Depending on what was going on and uh, if the weather was bad. The, the worry was what the weather was over the target. Yeah. We took off some time where the visibility wasn't uh, the perfect, and uh, we made it. A lot of time we talked. We had a flat tire one time. We had to go run back, and we didn't participate. So oh. a lot of things that you didn't even identify with that happened. And you would you had uh, what did you what kind of clothing did you have on? Well, what you had back here when the, you, you put on a flak jacket. And uh, a lot of people, when they made movies, they had a movie about the red tails and pilots had yes. like dark bigger helmets. Oh. It was bullshit. <laughs> Nobody wore helmets. I didn't wear a helmet. Some some guys in the, uh, that maybe I think some navigators and bombardiers were putting on their GI issued helmets. And mm -hmm. I, I I can't I never wore a goddamn helmet. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what people were identifying with. Granted, it probably had a little extra protection, but. I mean, I think you become fatalistic and dumb and young, and you figure you're, nothing was going to happen. But you got you got the message. Could you stay that, warm enough? Well, I had a suit that didn't work one day, and I changed mine and got, got into the middle of the aircraft. And the co-pilot gave me his suit. We swapped suits out, and then went back and everything worked. And they had got kind real cold was, back there. It was kind of like an electric blanket, more or less. Well, it had it was, wires. Yeah, it was like underwear with wires in it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then you had. Uh, when we first flew, we didn't have the electric heaters on the oxygen mask, and we had to break the ice out of it. Keep worrying about that. If you got plugged up, you're screwed. And then the, <clears throat> each, uh, we went over the target. I don't see the, they used to have a, sh a shaft chute, and they would, when we got near the target, the part of their job of the waste gunners would be to take the shaft, look like tinsel, aluminum, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, and they would stuff it through the door, and the whole group would be doing that. Uh, and it would confuse the radar. Yeah. And it would go out as a blanket behind the ship. But they have a shaft chute out there, and that's what their job was before they got in and started getting in over the target. They were mm -hmm. putting that stuff in through the. Yeah. But then the radio operator had to take pictures. He was in the camera well in the radio room. Mm -hmm. And part of his job was to take photographs as they went over the target. And then one day he didn't come out of it, and the waist gunner noticed that he was still bent over, and his oxygen mask came loose. And he went in on oxygen and put on an oxygen bottle, went over there and caught him in time. Otherwise, he he'd probably never made it. Now this 50 caliber here is that similar? Is that just like what you had back oh, yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I don't, I'm trying to relate to this. Looks like a more of an automated sight system. This is very modern. Uh -huh. The one we had was just a, uh, just a, a site with a, a little circle with rad locations. Uh -huh. and this this more looks more modern. We never had electronic. Site. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is not what we had. Yeah. And one time we were had two engines out and coming home. We threw all that shit out the window. We never had plastic windows. In there. Right. Yeah. I don't think. Right yeah, open. Yeah, we yeah, had yeah, doors. Yeah. And then the, yeah. the uh, so when we. When we had that problem, we had the engines out. We had to get rid of the weight. We threw the guns out, <laughs> and we don't know where ended up somebody's dinner table and we were somewhere. Did <laughs> and you have? They, the, and they, did, they, did, you, did you fly the model of the 17 that you could jettison the ball turret? Uh, no. In so fact, a had, lot of guys were. If you had were, belly land, your ball turret was in. It was screwed. Yeah. There was a lot of guys who were trapped. They couldn't. He couldn't get it and move the. Traverse, you get the guns down so we can get out. And when they had the belly land, the guy had lost his, couldn't get the landing gear down. And they, the, the 
they had no choice. He was still in there and got crushed when they landed. And you didn't get, you didn't get charged for throwing your guns out, right? No, <laughs> no. They, they didn't, you didn't have to pay. For, you people, didn't have to pay for him then. But some of these people don't know all the details of what went on. But everybody had their job, and uh, yeah. I think being young and when I relate to being able, I I walked around in this thing like it was another second home. Yeah. But I, you don't realize the environment that you were in all the time. You just took it for granted. And so there was a little door back by the tail gunner, and that's where, you, if you had to bail out, that's where that's you would what go I, out. I, I tried to figure out how I'd go how out. We, yeah, a lot yeah. of times I'd figure out how I could move out of there. But, you know, when you're on your knees for that length of time, and I know it, a few times it was a long missions, you were pretty, pretty tired, because you got up early in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, four o'clock or whatever to get things going, and then we were on. Uh, see, when they flew, we there were 50 missions or 35 sorties, and you kept track of both. I was seven short of each one. I had 43 missions, mm -hmm. and I had uh, 28 uh, sorties. Oh, okay. And then, but when you flew a long mission, you got when you had on a long flight instead of a, a single sortie, mm -hmm. they gave you the two missions. For, an, for a 10 hour flight. So he, your missions would, it was strange. I was seven short either way in <laughs> finishing whatever was going on. Yeah. What were some of the targets that uh, your aircraft Well, we, we went to, uh, they called it Berlin, but uh, we went on a Berlin raid, which was right near Ruland. It was named Ruland, Germany. Hmm. And uh, a lot of them we went were, uh, we went into bomb airfields, and a lot of them were, uh, uh, factories, and we, we bombed targets in Yugoslavia. We went in a support mission for the infantry in northern Italy, where there was a, a lower level uh, ground uh, of support for the infantry. Hmm. And we did uh, bombing on the German side, hopefully, <laughs> worry about that. And we used to fly uh, a lot of missions, you, uh, you had to go over the Alps to get to Germany, hmm. and even to Yugoslavia. And uh, I remember that, it seemed like you could drag, I always made statements, you could drag your feet in the snow <laughs> when we went over the Alps. But, uh, yeah, I didn't but, realize that uh, you guys out of Italy ever went to Germany. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and then yeah. They, they, uh, the 8th Air, Air Force um, had a mission where they bombed in Germany and they kept going and landed in Italy at our air base. Oh, uh-huh. We made sure they brought scotch with them. <laughs> <laughs> Did, uh, and when you got back, they would debrief you? Oh, yeah, and the Red Cross gave you a little shot of booze. Yeah. And try to drain your brain, figure out. But uh, the, the thing that was, uh, uh, I think, uh, it's, again, we were back there, and, and when the, the big worry was uh, flak. Yeah. And then is that the, what, when you uh, had to toss out your guns, is that what well, we had, was the we, problem? Well, we, we had engine trouble, oh. and the 17 could maintain and fly it with two engines. And uh, we lost one, and we got caught in a thunderstorm as well. Oh. And we, the, uh, the whole squadron breaks up and almost on your own to come back. And uh, that was a big thing. That happened several times. But you relate to the worthiness of uh, B-17, it's just, uh, you just take it for granted, you know, you can fly that long and not have, have a problem, but... Uh, Any, anybody get hurt on any of your missions? Well, they got some close calls. Uh, the waste gunners, I think, uh, a, a flak came in one side and the guy happened to be bending over and it went out the other side, a hole about four or five inches big, and <laughs> it was over, you know, but it felt like when you went over, uh, when you were flying, uh, with the uh, and the flak was coming up, it sounded like somebody's throwing stones mm -hmm. up the, on the fuselage, yeah. and then you get back and look at all the different holes and stuff, figure what what were you. It was, you know, you're just like I think one mission we had to go over the target twice, and the lead group, the pilot, didn't want to go over, so he broke off, and our our squadron took over his lead, and we went back and came over the target the second time. And he wouldn't go over twice. It was, it was got pretty heavy. Yeah, well, they're but, but waiting for you. We always relate the 88s for black, and then there was 105s, were and the white, and then there was a phosphorus artillery shell that would come up. It would be pink, hmm. and you could look out there and see all the different goddamn colors and the shit. You know, and they just keep your fingers crossed.
And you, that was you, the biggest, I think, worry when they, when you relate to the guys in the Air Force had to fight yeah. uh, fighters and all that, and then, and also deal with the flak over the target. Did you but, see any of your? Well, no. I watched when I see a, when I first saw a B-17 in a tailspin, and then there were then we were told to watch to see if you see anybody bailing out, yeah, right. and then you had to count when we were going up. We flew probably a lot of the missions at 30,000 feet. It got 30 below zero or more, and uh, that's one of the big things. Oxygen, make sure that things yeah. worked, and uh, well, you, I think you plugged in your electric all, in every different position you were in. But uh, when you look at how the aircraft was made, but uh, yeah. the biggest worry was uh, for us was flying over a target and getting sure. shot at. And, that, uh, and you were a staff sergeant? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They, well, they, we went over as sergeants, and they made we made staff sergeant. Yeah. Why we once you got in the air, and then you were you had flight pay fifty bucks a month instead of twenty five. <laughs> Big deal. You make a lot of money. But anyway. Well, okay. Well, I tell you, sergeant. Let's uh, let's head back upstairs, and yeah. we'll continue on. Well, Thank anyway, you for coming you felt, in here. Uh, yeah. When you first see a, a 17, that big aircraft getting shot at, and mm -hmm. the tail's been for, man, you know, all of a sudden the mind starts to work over yeah. time if you're, you know, you're not, but be, you became fatalistic. If, yeah. you're, if you didn't have that attitude, you'd yeah. be in that, that shape. Yeah. yeah. Did you see any of them? But, wait a well, a lot of guys I knew became prisoners of war. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can oh, you got it? Okay, good. Well, right, you're in good shape. Did you see any of them take any direct hits? Well, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes you, knew you, they got, you knew they got damaged pretty well pretty when good, you see yeah. the smoke. And, yeah. And uh, when you see this thing going down like that, you're, you're, all of a sudden you're, you're in a different world. Yeah. <laughs> you're, yeah. Man, you can get hurt. <laughs> yeah. Of course, your experience, and, and we talked about this earlier, you actually got to the European theater at, at what I, date? I, it was in uh, 44, in October of 44. October 44, and at that time you were stationed in? In Forgia, Italy. In yeah. Italy, and uh, the Red Tails were there at the same time. Yeah, so they, they, they had a, they they had a joining air, uh, uh, airfields that they operated out of. And occasionally you can see they took off two two at a time. And when you look at fighters, mm -hmm. and then they had the uh, when you look at the preparation of the uh, landing strips, a lot of them were where the aircraft were stored. They had these metal uh, platforms that they operated out of. Because when the weather when it rained, man, it would mess with the uh, ground. You weren't have you didn't have a solid mm -hmm. you know, no base. Yeah, and then we took off, and a lot of those metal. Uh, uh, they have the name for them, but uh, some of that metal would stick PGP. up in the lust. Yeah. <laughs> was it was it PGP or? Well, it was letters? metal. It was, was a metal metal sheets. Metal sheets, and but they were uh, uh, perforated, mm -hmm. and they were joined together. And sometimes that's where we got a lot of times where we had flat tires, and, and you could go to take off, and they're punctured. Punctured, yeah, because of the metal on the ground, but. Uh, but we, I think, uh, weather and the target was a predominant thing to consider. We had uh, weather conditions were maybe not perfect in terms of visibility, but mm -hmm. uh, we took off and then we tried to join, join up as a group or a squadron. That was the biggest thing, getting together. Then we made the move and flew out, and they had it's all tied to timing. And the main thing was the focus of the weather. And, they did, when you try to relate to knowing what the weather was in Germany, with more detailed interest to them mm -hmm. than how the weather was in Italy. But uh, there were certain times, a lot of times we couldn't fly because of the weather. How many aircraft do you recall losing in the process of forming up? Well, it, I, I think uh, we lost a lot. We had training flights we had when we weren't flying missions, and we lost some during training. And it was hard to understand that uh, an aircraft could in, in, fly into a mountainside, and for whatever reason, I don't know what would cause it, but we lost uh, people that way. And then we, there were a lot of aircraft that, once they got airborne, wouldn't wouldn't be able to fly either because of engine trouble or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
and then you had to regroup and adjust to try to make sure you had squadron capability and all that. But as a group, you had probably three squadrons together. Yeah, three so, so what was the average size of your attack force? Oh, I think uh, in terms of that knowledge, we didn't, I think people were beyond my area identified with that. I had no... You didn't need to know that. I, yeah, the need to know wasn't there for me at all, no. All I knew was in my particular aircraft, and I knew that we, had a, we were within a group or a squadron group. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, what I say, when we lost, when they talked about the lead group squadron, and then they had two adjoining, we probably flew one, two, three, four. And then they talk about tail end Charlie, but uh, when the one time when we had to fly and the one squadron leader, he peeled off and said, no way, he was only going to go back over the target. I don't know how the hell they dealt with him when that happened, but then we have to take over as a lead squadron to regroup and go fly. How many planes in a squadron? I think that we had four. I think we had four. I mean, one. Abel, Baker, Fox. Uh, I, th I always. I think I have diagrams mm -hmm. identified with that. Four or five. Four. One, it makes sense to think of four. Four or five. I think that, and maybe this is just my own lack of knowledge, but I think a lot of people tend to think that the majority of the bombing that came out of Foggia was done by B-24s yeah. because of Puesti and all the uh, uh, publicity that yeah. that raid yeah. got. Uh, what, in your in your experience and with, with your knowledge, how what was the percentage of 17s to 24s? Well, I think early on they did a lot of the Plessy raids, the 24s, and uh, they 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 had limited capability. In fact, I came back with a crew on a B-24, flew back with them. They kept the B-17s to fly the infantry and people that were in prison camps and stuff like that. But uh, I flew back with a B-24 crew, and that plane made me nervous. And we're, our our uh, 17 people versus 24s. The 24 was a box to be 17 came in. Mm -hmm. They didn't like to hear that, but that's what we always used to throw back at them. And uh, but 24 could fly at 25,000 feet. They couldn't go over 25,000. We could fly at 30, which made me feel better. But when you figure they had 5,000 feet less capability, and the plane flew a lot different. It had the high wing. We mm -hmm. were a mono plane. And when I flew back, and that, that it made me nervous to fly that 24. The wings would go up and down, and uh, the guy wanted me to go back and look at the tail. I said, forget it. I'm going to go back and look at his tail position. I had no interest in what they had to do. The plane <laughs> shook a lot more. That's just another one of those products made yeah, in they Detroit. They kept saying that it had a Davis wing, but that didn't thing didn't fly. It wouldn't glide, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't fly on two, two engines. B-17 could fly on two. 24 would fly, drop like a rock. And I used to tell these guys that, and I said, the hell, even flying back, and we landed in the Azores, and then we went on to Africa, and some of the landings and takeoffs made me, scared the shit out of me. <laughs> and then we flew back and landed in, in uh, New Zealand, then we landed in uh, a New England area, and uh, that was a trip back, but that was, uh, it was interesting. I got sick. In the Azores, I got, I got tomine poisoning, eating an egg sandwich, mm. and uh, I got very sick. I threw up and shit all over the place. I lost a lot of my clothing. But then the place was full of people. There was an air transport command, and they would, we went in there and got sandwiches. It had a, a ham sandwich and an egg sandwich. I think I ate my egg sandwich versus this buddy of mine. We were both on guard duty on the aircraft. We had to be there. So we the same thing in Africa. You had to sit, had guard duty to protect the aircraft. A lot of these people would go in there and steal stuff off the aircraft. <laughs> but it was a different different world, people. Well, I think your opinion about the difference between the uh, 17 and the 24 has more authoritative position because of your understanding of aeronautics prior to getting into well, the military. It, it had a feeling. You know, you talk, they talk about the Davis wing on the 24. And uh, to me, it lost lift at a, at a certain speed. And the, I think.
Got 17 had better glide capability than a, B, than a B-24. And for that reason, I guess maybe at a certain flying attitude, the 24 did well, but it had to get up in the air first. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was just generally something I, I felt. But whatever, they flew good low level flight capability. And that's what they did with Polesti and when they bombed the uh, oil wells and stuff. But I, did, did that occur while you were stationed in Italy? They, I think I identified that, that happening before I got there, mm -hmm. the Polesti rates. And, uh, and I was associated more, the uh, 24s were more active in that area. But I never caught sight of 24s after that. What did they tell you about the success of the Polesti raids? Well, they, it was just uh, historically something that, uh, it was not something that we really dwelled on, but I think we knew and heard about it. And they uh, talked about uh, how they were able to be, I guess, accomplish a certain aspect of the effort mm -hmm. and of the war effort at that time. But uh, we're just something historically that some people they were identified with, nobody dwelled on it. We were all 17s there. <laughs> what, what were the type of targets that you seemed to be assigned to, to strike during your, your I, missions? I think we, we went into airfields. We were uh, dealing with munition plants, factory type of efforts. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm trying to think of more of uh, railroad yards, and uh, so that was a lot of our efforts were are associated with that. And then we did support missions for the infantry in northern Italy, low level, mm -hmm. and uh, not too much too much of that. But a lot of it we flew over the Alps most a lot of the time, so we were beyond we were into Germany a lot. In fact, I've got a whole history of all my in Salzburg, Germany, Ruland. And then, uh, then we had uh, targets in Yugoslavia, and uh, I've, I have a good record of everything I flew, all the missions. So the vast majority of your missions were strategic rather than tactical? Well, kind of tactical, I'd say, when we flew support for support the Support for the yeah. troops, yeah. yeah. But otherwise, they were strategic. Right, exactly. Now, that means that you would probably be dropping your ordnance in areas where Populations of civilians were relatively high. Did you have any feelings about this at the time? No, or? I think I think at my age, I had no didn't it didn't, it didn't, it didn't it strike was. you. All I knew was we kind of joked about the fact when we had to throw out some of the heavy stuff out of the aircraft when we had engine trouble, and we joked about maybe some guy having dinner in Yugoslavia or wherever the hell it was, and, <laughs> and, a, a, and a 50 caliber dropped through the roof and laid, ended up on their dining room table. <laughs> <laughs> so we wondered where the hell the ordnance went when we threw it out of the airplane. <laughs> so what what was the uh, uh, size of the combined units of 24s and 17s at Foggia? How many how many squadrons? I have, I have no you idea. Just, you didn't got know. A clue. Did you live in a Quonset hut? No, hell no. We had to make our own tent. Tent. When we went in there, we set it up, and then we finally found enough bricks and put a, a, a cement floor in our tent. And then we How many guys in the tent? We had the, all of our enlisted crew. We had, uh, we were, we were, I think it was six of us, whether we had uh, yeah, one, two, three. So the, so the tent was, was crew? Yeah, yeah, enlisted men. Yeah. The officers were right. separate. Yeah. Were they in Quonset huts? Yeah, they probably had, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, the, uh, they had cement block structures mm -hmm. that they built. We didn't have concerts. You know, I think the only concert uh, identification I could make was where we had the mess hall and we had the enlisted men's club and stuff like that. But a lot of the officers' quarters were uh, uh, between, were built from way back mm -hmm. or when, when they first got uh, Foggia started and a lot of them were built as uh, uh, cement structures, mm -hmm. and they had a pretty pretty nice building. We all lived in. What was the heat source in your tent? We 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 uh, created our own. We had uh, we cut a barrel, uh, uh, fifty gallon barrel in half, and then we had a lot of the uh, Germans left behind a lot of uh, diesel, a lot of fuel oil, and uh, then we uh, created our own piping system into the tent, 
and uh, create our own burning system and the stacks. Mm -hmm. And we even had a prithium bomb that we made and put on a pulley to clean the stack out and get the mm -hmm. black crap with the mm -hmm. liquid. We didn't have a perfect burning system, but if that thing could get red hot. Yeah, I would I would be concerned about carbon monoxide buildup too. Oh no, well we were it was pretty well vent. We were well ventilated. Venting. Oh yeah, we had a pipe and but the uh, burning process went straight up. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes when you cleaned it out and it was a little burning and we burned a few holes in the tent, the stuff went down on the tent. Hopefully surface. not over here. But. No, no, we just <laughs> we we de we dealt with whatever we had to deal with. Yeah. It was when you Relate. We even put the sides out and found wood structure and mm -hmm. made expanded it. So everybody, if you lived in within where the tent was pulled out, that's where we put the beds out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few times we had uh, experiences where uh, I think the radio guy or Gamble came into the one night drunk and he had a 45 and started to shoot holes through the tent firing the guns. And then uh, the older guy, McGowan, we tackled him, and the, the chief engineer got him on the ground and tried to get him sobered up. There's some real now, screw where would he go to get himself in that condition with it? Well, we had the we had a uh, the a town uh, close by, or well, no, we had uh, the, on the base we had they had a Washington a, a officers' club mm -hmm. and enlisted men's club, and the, all you can get is wine, not too much hard liquor. And uh, maybe in 3.2 beer, mm -hmm. that was it. But he probably drank enough of that crap that <laughs> he, got, he got a little bit out of line. <laughs> Aside from the uh, uh, egg salad sandwiches, how was the food? Well, not, not too great. I, we had uh, got a young kid to help us clean the tent. And Salvador, 12-year-old, he was like a 30-year-old. Hmm. He grew up, you know, and they, he was supporting a family. And uh, we, we, I, I would give him a carton of cigarettes. I didn't smoke. I didn't start smoking until after I came out of the service. But uh, I give him a carton of cigarettes. He give me a dozen eggs, fresh eggs. Mm. Otherwise, we ate powder eggs. Our, our food wasn't that great. Supposedly at Christmas time they had a Christmas dinner, and uh, probably better than normal. But uh, I didn't gain weight. I'll tell you that. I, mm -hmm. I, when I was there, I lost a lot of the weight going over on the boat. Didn't eat that well on the trip over. But uh, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't be gaining weight on the diet they had. You know, you bring up the subject of weight, and and uh, I think if you look at photographs of crews during World War II, the first thing you notice is uh, that everybody looks trim. And in shape, and and the purpose of that is practical, because uh, for every pound that a crewman weighs, you can carry yeah. less in the way of bombs and munitions. And that's and, a nice philosophy. But I think if you could eat more, you would probably would. Yeah. Have. Well, it, it it makes you think maybe there was some method in their madness, but but <laughs> I I think it is remarkable if you look back in pictures. Uh, of, of World War II crews, that they're, they're all extremely slim people. And you mentioned downstairs that everybody gathered in the radio room for takeoff. And that may sound like, well, let's all get together and talk about what's going on. But it had to do with the distribution of weight in the aircraft when it took off. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a reason for everything. And uh, I, I it's my understanding that you were rationed with the, the amount of ammunition that you could have on board. Well, I think that there somebody, was a limit. Somebody asked me that when I visited the museum, and uh, he was asking me the uh, did I have backup ammo and re reload, and I, I tried to tell him I never had that problem because right. I never fired a gun. You never so I never fired. had the idea of having to reload and, and and do any of that, and so I couldn't answer his questions that he was identifying with. Cause well, that's a, that's a in, in a way, it's kind of lucky that you didn't have to ever do that. But it's also kind of a tribute to the Red Tails. Uh, oh, yeah, well, and it, tell us a little bit about the feeling you had when you saw a Red Tail P-51 oh, oh, no. in well, they, close escort. There was a lot of, uh, 
I think you relaxed more. You had a better feeling that you were being protected, and uh, you knew they were. God knows, you know, when after they left you, and you were at the initial point, and then they broke off, and they were probably fighting, doing their thing beyond and outside. I know if they got too involved, they had to drop their their support fuel tanks if they got into any air battles with with German fighters. Mm -hmm. And gosh knows what they were doing when they left us and we went over the target and then we came back and they would join us on the way on the way back as well. Early on, they would normally would take you there and then disappear because they didn't have the range mm -hmm. to be able to stay uh, with you and, and fly around and watch. And no, they couldn't. <laughs> yeah. And but uh, they were, that, that they had that ability and we had a lot of good feelings about the fact that they were there and stayed with us, but. Uh, no, we had uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, see, when you look at a bomb group, there are many, like probably four or five, probably four squadrons. I have a diagram. I could be more intelligent about it. But uh, as a group, uh, and uh, we had more than one squadron, so we had one, two, almost the same way a squadron was identified. Mm -hmm. Then the then the bomb group itself consisted of at least four squadrons. So the, as a group of planes, you were talking about a lot of aircraft. And the uh, same thing when they talked about when, when the 8th Air Force trying to count how many aircraft was up in the air. And then you talk about fatalities. And it didn't, until I started to read about it myself, there was a higher fatality rate in the Air Force versus ground troops. Mm -hmm. And we would occasionally, we would have infantry people. And it was all part of this educational process. They would, they would fly, and then would come back down and kiss the ground and then want to go back up again. And you figured, that, see, they had a different view mm -hmm. of their ex exposure or whatever to flying versus being on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I always felt the guys on the ground had a, a tough life. You know, at least when you came back to a tent. Mm -hmm. In the 8th Air Force, they were living in Quonsets. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had a different living arrangement. But I never. It may have looked good, but it wasn't necessarily safer. Yeah, but I mean the idea that uh, uh, you live with what you had. I didn't make a comparison about anything. Did you ever have access or or get any information about the casualty rate? And I, I know that that uh, the Air Force published in retrospect uh, what your chances were. Uh, you, you never, never looked at statistics in that. And, and never so, had any of that comparison, because so you did. You didn't know. You didn't need know. The need what was to going know on. was, and it was probably something you did. The only thing you knew that when you missed somebody, that a mission happened and that crew didn't come back, then you wondered what happened and whether they were safe or not. Then you found out they became prisoner of war, for whatever reason they mm -hmm. were able to. How, how they got that information, I don't know. Don't know how it happened. But I knew that some guys told stories, they tried to escape, and they caught them and they beat their feet so they wouldn't be able to walk again. And I, I know that one kid was a, could, was an outstanding ball player in, in high school, and then, then he heard stories when, after he was a prisoner of war when he came back and what, what happened to him. And, but you only got that as feedback and mm -hmm. information. Individual situations. Yeah, and, if, and, you, and you, then that sort of... Yeah. You realize that uh, things can happen, people, and the people that you knew you're identified with. Yeah, it's it's uh, the chaos that really is war is impossible to understand unless you're part of it. Right, right. And then uh, when you when you saw things happen, then you weren't strictly an observer anymore. Right. Things could happen, and you could you could actually get hurt. And when you started to think that way, then you had a, you started to create a different idea within in your mind about your exposure, and and uh, then uh, again when you came back and they wanted you to volunteer to fly in B-29s, then in your mind you said, no way, I ain't gonna, mm -hmm. I've done what I could, and I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna get you, could get, you could get hurt, and I, I don't need that. Well, it's interesting that you you had the experience of serving in two distinctly different. Uh, uh, parts of the B-17. Uh, if you had your choice, if you had to fly one of those missions today, 
Would you choose to be a ball turret gunner T or a tail? Gunner? I wouldn't fly the ball. I when I my experiences, I think I did it twice, and uh, I had no desire to. What are your recollections about the bad part of it? Well, I think the I felt more confined. I thank God I I wouldn't uh, uh, the guy feel it would be uh, identified with being confined in any fashion, but I knew your limited ability mm -hmm. to survive if something happened. And uh, you felt more alone and uh, isolated. Even w in the tail, I felt I was, mm -hmm. I was within the aircraft, and that way you felt more exposed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a, a different experience. And Did you experience, by, by virtue of the different positions of of the, the two guns. Uh, did you experience more air sickness? In, I never, I never, never had, had that. No, never had any. Did you, did you have any feeling about being tossed around at the end of the? Well, no, I think you, uh, you lived in the world that you had and you became comfortable with what, uh, what, what went on back there. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't have uh, too much, uh, time to think about being in the ball turret and being any different. All I knew was you were confined and you were within a tight atmosphere. And uh, you, you I, I think I was more intrigued by the view I had and my ability mm -hmm. to watch the bombs go to the ground, but being young and, and, and interested more about what was happening, <laughs> a new experience. And that's what I focused on. And you weren't worrying mm -hmm. that you were going to get shot at or any of that stuff. But you were focused on identifying with what a new, you were seeing. You no, know, yeah, a new experience, a new experience. And like again, you had this idea of being an observer. You never felt you were exposed to anything until things started to happen. And when people, and you'd go back and look at the aircraft and look at all the holes and you figure, no, well, you could get hurt in this business. But then the, when you saw some of your friends die, and you figured, well, you had a different... But your mind uh, worked in a, in a way that isolated a lot of stuff that happened. You didn't dwell on it. Mm -hmm. And then you worried about people that worried about getting hurt. Mm -hmm. And you thought about it, and you tried to tell them, no, nah, don't, don't worry about it. Well, one of the things that when I heard that you served in both those positions on the plane, I got to thinking, you couldn't be in two different, more different situations. One has a very limited field of fire, the other yeah. has an unlimited field right. of fire. Right. So that really, the, it's totally different. The role is uh, totally different. And uh, your ability, uh, you had to adapt. And for me to go into that position, which I never had any experience, for them to feel that I could go into that spot and and do the job the way I had to, I had no no opportunity to, to really uh, learn and experience. Hey, traversing and moving around, I I fool around myself. But then when when I I dozed off the one time, the gun was moving whatever reason traversed over, mm -hmm. and the one other another aircraft said, hey, the guy is. The guns are pointing at me. What the hell is going on? Well, why would they get nervous about that? You know, I'm not going to. Nobody's going to shoot at them. You still have to pull the trigger. But then the <laughs> pilot called and made. They woke me up. I think somebody would hit on the. Pounded on the turret. So it got me woke. And told me to wake up. So I know you said when we were uh, in the uh, B-17 part of the interview, how many missions and how many sorties? How, tell us again. Remind us what that number was. Well, it was 43 missions and translated to 28 sorties. And when you flew long, when you're on long flights, you, you were then identified you had uh, one sortie, and on a long flight you had d two missions. They doubled it. So the time in the air gave you a, a different value for mission versus a, a single flight. Every flight you made was counted as a sortie. So that was f flights off the ground. And the time and involved in, in, in that flight then get, constituted a, a double mission. Mm -hmm. So the count, 50 missions or 35 sorties, you were done with your, your flight program for you 
and you could so qualify to... 50 and 35. 50 and 35. But it seemed with the number seven seemed to be the, the uh, differences on both. For some reason, I was seven short on the, on the 50 missions and seven short on the sorties. So I had 28 and versus 43. And was came out seven for other reasons. So, so what what specific effect did that have on you? When the war in Europe was over, yeah, that's you, what it, that's you still what, you still owed them a certain number. Of, yeah, I, I would be either seven or whatever. Yeah, but I think the idea that uh, it ended that way, and I know a lot of the guys would go to uh, they had rest facilities in in Italy, and uh, they could go to and. Uh, after they finish 50 missions and maybe come back and and if you want if you <laughs> some, at some point in the war you had no choice you were like a revolving door mm -hmm. you flew 50 and came back and or depending on your mental condition you would probably sent back home or stayed on the ground or whatever how much of that grounding for uh for those purposes did you see i, I there were some issues, I would not identify too much with it, but you depend on how the, some of these gentlemen were married and they had more emotional connection with home. All more, they did more was to lose. Went, more to lose. Yeah, they had, they had different emotional feelings about flying. And, you, you know, I think being young and not attached in that way, I think that was a benefit to mm -hmm. me. And you could see people had a different time when they had family, and they were more uh, worried about uh, uh, their life and whatever. But uh, So tell us about your transfer back to the States. Was that at the time when Germany surrendered? Uh, the, yeah, the war ended, and then Twining, and then they had uh, all the, I think all the uh, mm. elements of the war ending was very well established. And we waited around quite a while before the, we were able to uh, be identified with where we were going to be shipped and how we were mm -hmm. going to transfer and go back to the States. And then, like I say, finally, I think we, we sat around for quite a while. I probably remember whether it was in June we left. I have it in my diary. But uh, then we were assigned for, with a B-24 crew. And I got to know that uh, the guy that was a tail gunner, his name was Jim Jamrock. We ended up in Illinois, and when we when we, uh, when I came back from uh, rest camp, and then uh, I I uh, when we while well, we first came back, I spent time before I went to rest camp. We were with Schnoot Field, and then I we uh, I met his family. I stayed with them, and my family were all waiting at the train station to come home, and I. I didn't show up. <laughs> I stayed with him for quite a while. And then the family, then he, I had enough points to get out of service. And I, but after, then I got home and then I went to Santa Ana for, for they call it like a rest area. And then you've met a lot of guys who were different Burma theaters and they had chronic diarrhea. They had issues that mm -hmm. you just couldn't identify with. I was very fortunate. But I got to stay with him and his family, and and then I stayed connected. And he had to go back. He stayed in the service, and he was went back to Texas. And he had a lot of issues, and he was uh, his family. I wrote letters to me. Uh, I was still in the service, and uh, and they they were wondering if I could help out with James. He was having trouble, mm -hmm. and he he got uh, drunk while he was in Texas. He was in the clink, in jail. So he was having a lot of uh, emotional issues, but but he was a tail gunner on that mm -hmm. B-24 crew. I got yeah. For some reason or other, that that uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome that we hear so much about yeah. nowadays, they didn't. They, they didn't. almost got swept under the rug. You know, it, it did. Never, never really yeah. identified with a person and how they. It's hard to it's hard to believe that uh, there was any less of it as a result of. The Second World War experience, and there would be after Iran or Afghanistan, but now apparently the military is really more tuned into it. Yeah, there's probably a lot of it. That, uh, yeah, that, that, I'm sure there's a lot of it that went undiagnosed and untreated. Exactly, I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, 
but you could see it with some people, but uh, you had, uh, but being uh, young in terms of being able to emotionally associate yourself with psychological mm -hmm. issues, but I think in some cases you could talk to some people that were had, uh, well, like I say, I talked to guys when I was in Santa Ana, they were at a China Burma theater and they, yeah. those guys were had a lot of a lot of issues. Well, in a way, in a way, that that principle of uh, gradually getting back to civilian life by having you spend time with uh, other uh, veterans that have had experiences is like group therapy. Yeah, that you can find out that the other guy had a, a problem that was worse than, than but, yours. But Jim, there's no when I came back. Well, every other guy. Had, General Motors Institute were in the military. Mm -hmm. And I, we, in the fraternity house, I had guys who were some lieutenant, uh, he was green as can be, and he would make a bitch about, I was a guy taking care of uh, uh, the menu when we were in the fraternity house, what we were going to eat, and what, he was bitching about the dessert and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had another guy that was in the fraternity house, uh, and he flew, he was a waste gunner, during, in the Eighth Air Force, he lost a leg. Don Summers, and we sat there and listened to this guy give us a bunch of crap about what he was eating. We told him to knock it off, and he, you know, he, but as a group, nobody talked about their war experiences. I never sat down and talked to Don about how he, how he, uh, dealt with uh, being a waste gunner, mm -hmm. and, and he was on a B-17, and he lost a leg. Yeah. And I'm talking to people. I said, "Christ." <laughs> well, maybe maybe it has something to do with the the universality of of a commitment that everybody yeah. uh, was involved in some way, and so the tendency would be perhaps to say, "Big deal." Yeah, and the, another guy was in there. He was a B-17 pilot. Uh, another guy flew B-51s, and we never we would have beers and talk. We never talked about yeah war experiences. And so when's the first time, when's the first time you can recall, you say you wrote a diary. Yeah. When did you start writing that? Uh, when I got on the boat, going overseas. Okay, so it was right away. Yeah. Day to day, every it day. Wasn't, it wasn't a 10 year period or a 20 year no, period no, no, or no. anything like no, that. No, it was right at the time I was living it. And like I say, I just found a little phone directory. And I've got all that stuff laying on the table over there. And uh, I used that, and my sister-in-law transcribed. You can see the writing that I had. And I looked at it, and re I reread it. I said, how the hell could I sit there and read that? But I wrote very small. Mm -hmm. And it came out many pages of uh, reading and all the detail. What we ate on the boat, and hard-boiled eggs, and everybody would, the crew was eating steak, and the officers and all these other guys mm -hmm. living high in the hog. And then McGowan made, he, he worked in the kitchen when they prepared the meals. He brought a steak sandwich back for the rest of us maybe to eat. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I bitched about it. Every other day was about, oh, we had hard-boiled eggs again. What, what what's, your, <laughs> what's your feeling, and what, what has been your feeling as you go back and reread this diary? What, what effect does it have on you? Well, I think it refreshed my memory a lot. I think it gave me an idea, an insight of what the experience was. And, the, and we were in a convoy on the way to Italy and uh, the 17 days on the boat. And then we, it was just uh, the stages of experience and we knew who was on the boat. And we had a lot of uh, airborne people that were mm -hmm. treated like kings, infantry. And we were just treated like just everyday citizens. Margaret Burke White, Life Magazine, mm -hmm. the reporters who were mm -hmm. on the boat ride. And uh, we had escorts, destroyer escorts. We had uh, many days at sea. You got an idea of what it was to be on the ocean. And I read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. And I, I was on uh, latrine detail. You do that on a boat and watch this stuff slopping around. And you're with a mop and trying to do stuff. <laughs> so you you really you really by by virtue of the fact that you did that you really have a valuable history you're kind of a historian. Well, I, with the book and I, it's like I said, why I kept the diary. It was just something 
I, I identify with, maybe because of the, uh, the way I related to detail and mm -hmm. my experience in my schooling, my education. And there was something I figured I'd keep, uh, keep a detail. Before we move on to your civilian <laughs> life, why don't you show us a picture of this tail gun position? Put it up here to the camera. Well, this is a more modern version. I, it looks like it's uh, probably 10 years or five years after I flew. I never had the electronics or the view. Of, uh, I never experienced that look at all. It's not something I'm familiar with. This is a, uh, turn that turn that uh, picture around, Frank. I want to try to explain to the viewer what this is. This is a uh, page out of the uh, uh, Air Force Museum restoration of the Memphis Bell. And it shows the, uh, the tail gun position that Frank served in and flew all those missions, except for a few as the uh, belly gunner. And you can see it's very tight quarters. And Frank tells us that uh, there was armor plate under his seat and mm -hmm. armor plate on the side. Yeah. And that he had a very limited uh, range of fire. Wore, wore a flak jacket as well. Yeah. And okay, Frank, turn to the page that shows the, uh, the ball gun. I believe it's the April month. April. June, July. There we go. There's the ball, separate. Yeah. Is that what you're talking? About? This is this is uh, the ball turret that's obviously out of the aircraft, uh, and that little door you see there opened up into the Inside. fuselage as the uh, ball rotated. The ball would rotate uh, uh, 360 degrees. Uh, in the horizontal plane and 180, 180 in, the, in the vertical plane. And uh, actually what you're seeing there is where the uh, gunner's back was located. His feet were up above his head and the sight was out the uh, other side of the uh, ball turret. It did have uh, some armor plate but was extremely confined and the rule pretty much was he weighed more than 130 pounds you weren't getting into this uh, this space because you couldn't get into it. And if you couldn't get into it, you couldn't get out of it. So. I practiced getting out of it. Frank said that he, uh, he actually uh, wore his uh, chest, pack. chest pack parachute into this. I, I know in some of the earlier models uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't possible. You had to keep your uh, your parachute up in in the fuselage. Yeah, um, I got in there with a chest bag. Yeah. So that was not much comfort. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, I fit, and I, if it fit, I went in with it. That's it. I was able to deal with it. <laughs> All right, we've 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 pretty much we've pretty much covered your uh, experiences in the military and you're back in Chicago at this point. And I think at this, at this uh, juncture, I'd like to ask your daughter to come up and join us. Okay. And we can talk a little bit about your post-military life. How are you doing? <laughs> okay, this is uh, Sheila Ryan. Uh, one of Frank's uh, daughters. Now, obviously, you were not married uh, when you went into the military. When did you meet your wife? And uh, tell us a little bit about starting a family and going back to school and what was happening at that time. Well, I, I met my wife in uh, 1948. And I think uh, as a young guy, I used to uh, go to the dance halls and all that stuff. and. Uh, had a group of buddies and we would meet. There's a bar downstairs. So I went up to the campus ballroom day one time and I met her and I quickly fell in love with this, one, with this gal. And Jenny was part of my life from, we got married in uh, 1949. She waited well through the year of uh, 1948. I, we were engaged for a year and it's something that today doesn't happen. But we were engaged and we were communicating by phone only and writing letters. 
And you didn't have the communication capability you have today. So where where were you? Uh, where did you go to school afterwards? When when you yeah. get out of the military, I went to John Morse Institute. I started, and I spent uh, half a year going to GMI before I went in the service, and then I got back out. I immediately went back to school. A lot of guys took the 52 weeks of company or the or the federal assistance. They get uh, uh, payments. Uh, uh, weekly, 52 weeks, you could get paid for a supplemental from the federal government. For doing nothing. For doing nothing. We've made it, we're, we've become expert at that. Yeah, and I didn't, <laughs> and I didn't, uh, I didn't participate in that. I went back to school right away and- To GMI. To GI, GI Bill, to General Motors Institute, and I was with Fisher Body. And uh, Jenny was very patient. We I would get, I would go to school a month and go, go to work a month. You met in Detroit. I met in Detroit, yeah, in Campus Baldwin. And uh, we were together from that point on, and uh, we got engaged within, I think, uh, several months. And then very patiently, but over the years, and making phone calls was a big expense. I even started working on a janitor at the school mm -hmm. so I can get extra money to be able to pay for phone pay calls. phone bills. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, it's nuts. Today, you know, people just take things with their ability to communicate. We did it, we got a letter every day. I got it from her and I would write letters every day. And then finally, just before I graduated. So she was located where? She was in Detroit. She was in Detroit. So, yeah. But you were pretty much conf like confined to campus or? Pretty much, well. And he was in Flint. Flint, Michigan. In Flint, Flint okay. So, 60, okay. 60 miles away. All right. And you can take a bus ride in those days for 50 cents. And uh, that was expense too. And uh, I know when I first started jet working, as I, when I finished school, I made it 250 bucks a month. And then it puts things in perspective in terms of your financial ability to do things. And even going to school, uh, I, my, my income at that time as a student was very limited. And thank goodness for the GI Bill, you know, you get to uh, be able to pay for tuition, which is $400, which is a lot of money. And, uh, but uh, see, we communicated, finally got a car, probably within that last year. What kind of car? A, a 48 Pontiac. Okay. And, uh, what color was it? It was blue. <laughs> blue. Yeah, and uh, every time I had an accident, I got it refinanced. So <laughs> that's what happened. I love that. <laughs> so that's why you were a tail gunner, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> so anyway, within uh, we got we got married in '49, and uh, shortly thereafter, my first son was nine months later. Was born in 1950. Brent James Pagano. And uh, then I, shortly after that, we lived and uh, we rented a home initially. And uh, then I was able to, uh, I was still working on my fifth year project when I got back, when I started back at GM. Now GM. you're in Flint or Detroit now? I'm in Detroit now at Fisher Body. Okay. And doing, I was involved in my fifth year program. And I was actually in the, in the state of uh, working on a job and being paid monthly as an employee, not as a student. And uh, being able to technically, and I, I, we were living with my, with my mom and dad when we first got married, and then we moved and found our own place. We rented a home, and then uh, I was traveling back and forth from Flint on my fifth-year project on that body analysis program, and uh, I would daily go to Flint, come back every day because my wife was expecting our first baby. So I was going, definitely not staying up in Flint. I was going back mm -hmm. and forth. And then the baby was born in, uh, in uh, January 1950, Brent. And then, uh, then we uh, proceeded to, then I finished my fifth year uh, early in 49. And uh, about the time that we got married, I was probably uh, pretty much on the way of finishing that program for the whole year of 49. And then early 50, I was done. And then uh, more confined to be able to be at home. But then I moved and we uh, bought our first home in Inkster, Michigan. And where? Inkster. Inkster. Yeah, yeah, which is just outside of Detroit area. And uh, there I stayed for probably 12, 12 years or more. And then all my children were born there. What so, was your wife's maiden name? Uh, uh, 
uh, Bytel. Pardon me? Bytel, B-I-T-E-L. And what Polish. What Mexi Polish. Yeah. Yeah. You certainly have an interesting <laughs> family background. Your family tree is very colorful. Well, that, I think that's <laughs> the, when, when you talk about the mix and uh, relationships and people and you, you combine nationalities the best of the in a best. way that, uh, and, uh, She was, you know, she was one of 10 yeah. children and grew yeah. up on a farm. Did, right. did, what was her, did, what was her educational situation? High school. High school? Yeah. And she worked at Burroughs when I met her. Okay. And, uh, the computer was, company or the? Yeah. The yeah. First slotting machines. Machine, yeah. yeah. And they were right just uh, south of uh, the Fisher Body mm -hmm. plant that I worked in. And, uh, so you both were good at machines. Well, I think she's a, a, a wonderful, very focused, very self-reliant. I think because of coming from a family that size, uh -huh. you learn how to really... Where did she fit in that She order? was number five. Number five. A middle child. Yeah. Okay. And she had, There were three girls and seven boys. Wow. And uh, there's five... So left. you didn't get away with very much then? No, but you, 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 <laughs> when, you said meet the, when you said meet the family, you were meeting quite a group of people. Uh -huh. So you're passing the litmus test to, uh, in terms of a choice to live within that group. But they were very much a good part of her life, and she was very family-oriented and uh, a great, great wife, and she raised, raised any kids. When I started working, I, I, I was away a lot and uh, away from home and traveled quite a bit, and she did a lot of stuff on her own. And uh, when, like I say, we had, uh, by the, when you look in the family, I think, uh, Brent was born in 1950, and then the second son was 19, I think, 53, and then Sheila was 1957, was it? 58. 58, yeah. So well, they were all born with. Tell me that about tour. what they did. Well, are they carrying on this wonderful tradition? <laughs> are, they, are they living up to the standard oh, that you yeah, set? It's, it's mixed. <laughs> my, my oldest guy followed um, and worked. And a lot of different jobs. Well, he worked at Ford Motor. Ford Company, Motor. Yeah, and retired primarily. From there. So, retired from in Ford. a sense, I think Brent, you know, followed. Yeah, I wanted my number two son to follow that path. I had the ability, being in management, being able to offer the opportunity to have my kids stay or follow a path in a Ford mm -hmm. Motor Company, but he chose to go on his own and identify with a different world. He was a marketing graduated out of college in marketing. And my uh, oldest guy started and finished maybe a couple of years, of it, but he fell out of the process of college education and mm -hmm. felt a little bit bad about it, but I think he had intelligent enough to be able to, a lot of the training they had and other schooling, and he followed the path within Ford. I got him different, mm -hmm. the ability to work in different areas, and he worked in the product development and, uh, er, and uh, working in uh, uh, prototype car development with a Ford mm -hmm. Motor Company. And uh, he got, and he, he retired early. I think it was probably in 50 or 55 when he left. And I told him to stay. There were times where he figured he'd leave Ford, and I said, nah, you got too much time vested in, in the Ford Motor Company to leave and look at your retiring capability. You're gonna have the 20 years in easy mm -hmm. and be able to deal with getting a, 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 a a pension and being able to live, you know, look down the road, down the road and plan your life. Mm -hmm. and but I think, to that. I think that uh, you set a very good example. Uh, education, mm -hmm. um, conscious of, uh, you know, learning and being productive and being mm -hmm. in, in supporting yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that when you see two people, like my parents uh, worked hard they weren't laying mm -hmm. around and mm -hmm. partying buying and, stuff and, and buying things they couldn't afford. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, you know, they... Buying on time is probably maybe something that, that didn't happen. And maybe that generation, you know, just exhibited yeah. those she made features. Clothing. Yeah. You know, my mom made clothing and so cooked and, you know, passed all of those experiences on to myself. And I think all of us, you know, you know, you... If you have examples set for you, however it is that you end up living your life, you know, you, you don't 
fault, like where you come from, or you know, you shouldn't. I mean, you should be very thankful, and I am. And I have a, this yeah. man in my life because he's amazing. And, and the thing he taught you was accountability. Yes. And responsibility. Yeah, and responsibility, and you know, taking care. You know, you don't yeah. pass. You don't throw it off to somebody else to do. You take care of it. Mm -hmm. You, you yeah. do. There isn't if there's a bullet else. hole in the tent top, you fix it. <laughs> Oh, and yeah, being, and resource, being resourceful. And being, right, being self-sufficient. My, self my wife was resourceful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Don't, yes. don't complain, fix it. Yeah. Right. yeah. So uh, I think you can point to, to those features. You mentioned something that I wanted to come back to just out of my own personal curiosity and that you said fraternity brothers. Where did you have fraternity brothers? Well, this was in Flint. and the, but, You know, our fraternity was like an outcast group. We weren't associated with the which we would call the uh, National Fraternity System. Okay. And uh, this was a place you can find, and sleep, get a bed, get meals, right. and, and live. And that's what I, the way I identified with it. So it was and, just, it was more a, a, uh, a group necessity. Right. right. And then a lot of these guys were the gung-ho types, one that wheeled the paddle and all that. And I said, mm -hmm. don't lay it on me and this hazing crap. I didn't. I didn't buy. I didn't go along with it. They didn't like the negative view I had of the so-called typical fraternity atmosphere, and I said, you know, I can lay off that stuff. I'll do what I have to do to be here, but beyond that, don't look for anything different. And I, I was a treasurer, and identified with uh, how we ran the fraternity house, mm -hmm. and looked at the money part of it. Everybody was identified with running phone bills, and I really when I try to call, identify with making calls to, to my future wife. We are very conscious of how they spend money. And Again, accountability. Yeah. and that's, uh, How high did you go at Ford or General Motors? Well, I ended up in World Headquarters. I worked in the manufacturing area. I was the uh, uh, manufacturing manager. I went into uh, the, I, I went from launching automobiles as a team out of the Automotive Assembly Division, which was mm -hmm. a central division. And I launched a lot of car programs. I, even, I launched the Pinto, the Maverick, and the mm -hmm. Mustang. Mm -hmm. And I uh, identified with doing that a lot. And then finally I made the move to be a manufacturing manager of a plant in Ohio. And that plant made the Conalines and the, and the Torino Montego. Mm -hmm. And then you learned a little bit more about just not design and manufacturing cars, but what it takes to keep the parking lot clear of snow mm -hmm. and hope that the trains don't sink and the... It's back to patching the tent. And then what you were <laughs> responsible for was the building mm -hmm. and making sure that the tools and everything were there to build the product. And you didn't... Your biggest worry was a fire. Mm -hmm. If you were at a fire, you lost your ass. You wouldn't be have a job. <laughs> Where were you in Ohio? I was in Lorraine, Ohio. Lorraine. Yeah, and they had the major facility there. They had both the Econoline operation and the, and the basic automotive. Being from Detroit, I'm sure you never developed into a Cleveland Brown fan. No, no. <laughs> no De Detroit, Detroit Tigers, Tigers and the Detroit Lions. <laughs> That's what it was all about. <laughs> but it, I think in management, I think in a plant atmosphere, it's, uh, uh, you have to do things uh, right away. Mm -hmm. and none of this manana stuff. You know, a lot of guys, when I went to World Headquarters, what a different world. Half them, they could take that place and blow it up. And yeah. it what's, <laughs> what's the difference between that and being part of a B-17 crew? If you had a problem, you had to take care of it. Immediately, yeah. But you, you, you ran into world of World Headquarters. I, I, mm -hmm. I, when I had people that I, that I was able to have the ability to form a new environmental and safety staff group. And right after they had the, Ford had the, the need to have a, a group of people dealing with federal regulations from emissions, mm -hmm. and then it was federal regulation for safety. And uh, for some reason, while I was in Ohio, I got a call to be interviewed for a job in this new organization that they were forming for automotive safety. And I was to be the compliance manager for manufacturing and assembly. And I figured, well, how did my name get identified with being able to be interviewed for that job? And it, it didn't come out of a computer. It didn't come out of some card somewhere. It was 
identify with the people you met along the way mm -hmm. that you worked with mm -hmm. and people I worked with. Uh, when I worked as a, in a team launching programs and then I worked on a Shelby program and I met people back then that were uh, manufacturing people that then went on to world headquarters. I also met people in automotive and the car development area engineering that were done, worked in the uh, vehicle development program in that process. So I, you, you met all the people in different groups. And when I launched cars, I, I, I was a manager of people out of chassis engineering, body engineering, and all the different groups of people. And I managed that group on a launch. And I think because of that working experience with these guys, and what was crazy about that, you worked as a, at a grade level of 12, and you were given the responsibility of like a 14 level. Mm -hmm. And that's what they worked with. You were given a uh, work responsibility that was way above your grade. And then they would tell you, if you had a problem, call this vice president, call this guy. Mm -hmm. And I did that. I would be there on Sunday and call some guy and identify with somebody who was having breakfast Sunday morning, and he was telling me, well, I'm having breakfast. I said, well, I'm in Ohio trying to launch a car, and I need help. All your people left. So I figured I should call you to need some help. Then they reluctantly talked, and I said, well, by the way, Don Bastian, who was the, the manager, manager, head manager, of the head honcho of the assembly division, he said, I, I, I was expected to call you or anybody if I needed help. Oh, Don Bastian, you mentioned the right name, and I was in the <laughs> jump through their hat. But, you know, you got to meet VPs and people that you could talk to, they were, and a lot of these people were open to you being in that position to talk to them about problems. Some weren't. And mm -hmm. people that were within the group I were were very protective. They were worried about who you were talking to. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm, I, I have to talk to these people. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, just sitting here objectively, uh, I think your time in the military sort of formed the type of strength and uh, accountability that you developed and showed as you went through life in civilian life. You depended upon the guys in the ground crew and everybody in that plane depended on the guys in the ground crew. You were always like the ground crews, my guess, that you always, you always knew what was going on and what was important. Well, I, I... You learned how to know what was important. Well, it was interesting when you, uh, the people, the flying personnel, <clears throat> almost, we were as a group living separately. The ground crew people lived in a different identification. Mm -hmm. The only time you would see each other when you went to the... the Aircraft. Well, when you were into the mess hall or you were in the... Uh, uh, had a few drinks in, in the uh, enlisted men's area and you talked to you were able to talk to them and I I think you appreciate the fact these are the guys that stayed up nights working on engines and stuff like that mm -hmm. and tried to get the aircraft ready to fly and you figured man how can an aircraft fly for 10 hours and get go back and forth and get back you know in one piece mm -hmm. so there was a lot of effort on the ground and they and uh, we always had the term ground. When we talked to the infantry, they were ground pounders, and we were we we flew. The other guys were on the ground, but when they were there's respect for the people that worked on the aircraft, and you would be able to talk to them, and enter. But again, there was a separation. The mm -hmm. officers were here. And there was a separation, but everybody knew what their job was and, oh, yeah. and, and, and what it, would happen if they didn't do their job. I, I think you respected the support yeah. you had and the people working together to get a job done. And that same feeling you had when uh, uh, you had certain people that finally came on the scene in management within the Ford manufacturing area that mm -hmm. said, hey, you, got, you guys got to start talking to each other. The electrical people and the body design people, the chassis people, and... Uh, you got to respect each other's job because you route wires through a, 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 a steel body and everybody has to know where the holes are and what you have to do. So everybody has to tell each other what your needs are and to work as a, as a team. And then I would have people 
within the group on a launch, and the guy said, well, I'm from body engineering. I said, well, I need somebody to work on the glass part of this car, you know, and, or work on mm -hmm. doing He said, well, I said, I, and you're here, I want you to do that. Mm -hmm. And then they come back and say, gee, I'm glad you, you directed me, I learned something new. But I said, you have to be able to adapt and help when the need is there. Yeah. And it, well, it, it is kind of a miracle. Every time I see an aircraft take off, it's kind of a miracle. Yeah. Every, time, every time I buy a car and drive it out of the dealership, and it doesn't rattle, squeak, or, or belch smoke <laughs> no. in the first 10 miles. It's kind of a miracle. People don't understand yeah. what it seemed to understand. The mechanics. The, well, the fact that in order to get the product that is, that is usable and durable, that it takes a lot of people to do it. You got it. Yeah. You got it. You got it. They take it for granted. When you see the finished product, and nobody goes back and tries to figure how it got there and what it how many parts are in that mm -hmm. car? And so how long the, did the you detail. how long did you end up working for Ford? And how old 34, were you when you thirty four years? And I had eight years at Fisher Body. And how old were you when you quotes retired? Which I, I doubt if you really. I ever bailed did. out early when the job got to be boring, and when I went to World Headquarters, I felt like I was re retired. I went from a job working probably ten hours on the average day, and maybe on a launch program twelve hours a day. And when you get to World Headquarters, these people worked eight hours, five days a week, and went home on weekends. And, and when they were working, they were really in committee meetings. No, they were. They didn't. They didn't have a clue. <laughs> when I would sit in meetings, and they were downplay the, what the manufacturing role was. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long were you? How long were you in that position? Probably over maybe 13, 14 years. When I, I left, in was 70, it frustrating? Well, I, th I think I, I didn't mince words because I came out of the manufacturing area and you would, uh, if you had issues, you would be very direct and identify with what had to be done and get things done right away. And when I got into World Headquarters, these people had the attitude, well, we won't deal with it today. I said, why not? Oh, we got, we'll do it Monday. This is like Friday. I said, that, that makes sense to me. And I would be frustrated with listening to these people like, oh, we'll take care of it, manana kind of bullshit. I said, I'm not built that way. I want to. Yeah. I the general's not going to take care of the hole in your tent. Yeah, you got it. And I told these people, <laughs> but I had many times where I, I had no patience. I would uh, say what I had to say and take it or leave it. And sometimes I'd sit, my, my bosses would sit there and squirm and, and I'd say, hey, you know, I, I've heard enough, I've heard enough excuses identified with how you people feel about the quality control and how the car is built, and half you people don't have a clue. I'd get a new guy on board, a new engineer, and I'd make arrangements for him to go to the Dearborn Assembly Plant. I said, why don't you go see how a car is built? And I'll have one of my guys go with mm -hmm. you. And, and the people that I hired in, in the... Uh, subordinate management positions beneath me, I made sure they came out of the plant area. They were all knew what the name of the game was. And the other guys had made sure they got educated and watched the car being built and what it took to build an automobile. Because when I got to World Headquarters, uh, because of the safety standards and that implication, we were dealing with lawyers, and we're, uh, bean counters, mm -hmm. I don't, I, no disparage, I don't mm -hmm. know where your background, but a lot of people got hurt when we were talking mm -hmm. about it. But, I, I know what you're saying. But the bean counters got, all of a sudden they thought they were engineers. Mm -hmm. And I go to many meetings and I bring the hardware with me. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about, we need it to change. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, apparently you don't know what the problem is. But there are other guys saying yes or no about making a change that we needed to help us manufacture the car. And I bring a bag full of parts and I throw it on a table. I said, that's what we're talking about. That's what So we're Sheila, doing. is this how you were raised? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 is the result of this in terms of your education and what you do today and how you've applied this example that your father has she, given she's, you? She'd be like the engineer in the family. Well, I'm not an engineer. I'm I know, a, but, I'm a, I went into medicine. But she has the mentality and the... Yeah. The, I, the no, I think when you, you grow up with someone that um, 
is, uh, you know, definitely speaks his mind, um, expects quality, mm -hmm. you know, it ex expects you to do your best and sets a standard. And I think it, it reflects in how, how you live your life. And mm -hmm. I always felt very uh, compelled, but both because of his father, my grandfather, about education being important mm -hmm. and, um, and then applying that. And to see, so what see field where, of medicine are you see in? See where it takes you. Um, I was a, I, undergrad. I was um, a pre medical student, but mm -hmm. I did not go into medicine. I ended mm -hmm. up diverting into microbiology and toxicology, mm -hmm. and um, mostly it's more like analytical chemistry. So okay. that was my. You background. have your PhD. I was working on that, and then got um, got distracted. Married. No, <laughs> no, got distracted by an opportunity with a company. Okay. I was already. Um, doing things at a PhD level in uh -huh. my area of expertise, but um, didn't complete my PhD, but um, had a master's level in science and and then went on to work for a company. It also brought me back to Michigan because I was living in Boston at that time. I really wanted mm -hmm. to be closer to my family. Then he retired and left and moved to Florida. Yep. So that didn't work out, but anyway, <laughs> no, then I got, I got married. Out at age 60. <laughs> yeah, I got married, had three children, you know, in four years, which was uh -huh. uh, quite daunting, and uh, it, it, and maintaining it gets your attention. yes, and maintaining a career, and uh, yeah, I think that I just think that exposure to uh, growing up in a family where education is obviously important and uh, responsibility, and so it. it Tell me it, about your kids. I <laughs> have I have three children. Um, very proud of all of them. Um, they're all college educated. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin is the oldest, and he's uh, right now living in Seattle. He works in advertising, has a degree from the University of San Diego mm -hmm. in marketing, and um, he's living uh, there and working on his own. is independent. Um, is not married. Uh, my daughter, my next youngest, is a daughter, Sarah, and she's working on her master's in nursing at University of San Diego. Mm -hmm. She just got engaged to uh, a marine pilot, yeah. an Osprey pilot, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so looking forward to that. Um, planning her. There's wedding. excitement for you in that. Yes, yes, <laughs> and uh, and just and then my youngest um, is. Um, I would say he's a, a spitting image and he's a clone of, of my husband, yeah. uh, Michael, and he's um, brilliant. Um, brilliant is right. And he's got a biochemistry degree and he's now working for a company that is creating a um, unique product for each cancer patient mm -hmm. based on their own uh, genetic makeup. Mm -hmm. So he works on that's that's the cutting edge. Cutting edge. Right. Cutting edge biochemist. That's amazing. He's going and, to be a doctor in that point. Well, and he's he's looking at graduate school right now. He's just getting. He just graduated this mm -hmm. last year, so he's working for a year for this uh, cutting edge biochemistry. Um, well, that's that's absolutely fascinating. So, wh where where do you live now, Frank? Well, I, I my <laughs> wife passed away in uh, June of uh, 2016, and. Uh, then I had to make some decisions about uh, where I, I'm looking forward. I'm not going to get any younger. And Sheila was really nice about uh, saying uh, opportunity to come and stay with her in California. And, and then when you relate to the uh, uh, where you're at in your life and what, what's what, and looking forward, granted my, my twin brother is up in North Florida. And He's still living. Yeah, we compare notes. We have different experiences health-wise, but uh, he's still there. And he was said, he said, uh, Fran, why don't you call me Fran instead of Frank? Because I grew up as a Francis, but it was Fran. And uh, he said, uh, you can come up. Why don't you come up and stay in my area? And it's, he lives in the villages, which is unbelievable. They create a... a in Florida. It's a yeah. large senior community. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Lots what, what, to do. What's wonderful about her, she said, Dad, you haven't seen your twin brother in quite I'd have to be. Well, because my, my mom was quite ill. She was he never left her side. He never yeah. put mm -hmm. her in a nursing home. He took care of her. He nursed her. And um, so when she passed, I said, let's go see Vic. You haven't seen him in she years. Seen, yeah. It's only a four-hour drive. Let's go. We're hitting the road. <laughs> you know, so just drove up there and from Naples. And then 
he, uh, you know, and he, so he, I said, you need to look at church opportunities. Do you want to maybe want to buy another little house near your brother and, and live out your years? A lot of people do in the villages. It's, mm-hmm. There's so many different levels of support there mm-hmm. for uh, aging. And um, I said, I, yeah, well, open invitation, come live with me. I have a single family, single, single story home, you know, where you mm-hmm. can, you'll be fine, you know, for many years to come and come and live, hang out. We have, I have two dogs, four horses, a uh, cat, you know, <laughs> <laughs> husband that comes and goes, you know, it's a little more, a lot going on, you know, yeah. something, to, you know, yeah. to keep your mind busy. So he well, did agree. I, he did agree to move in with me and moved here in October. Yeah. You know, yeah and that's, I can, I can understand that completely, but that may be a temporary adjustment phase. You never know what's going to happen with, with yes. someone like this. Yes. Well, if he just, he climbed into a B-17 today. Like, what was who, that all about? Who would ever guess? <laughs> How did that feel seeing that old bird again? Well, you know, I, I, I think I said this to somebody else. I can't believe how big the 17 looks like to me. And I was around that aircraft so much, it never seemed that large. Mm-hmm. But I even inside uh, uh, seemed to be more uh, confining. It seemed like I was more open or whatever. My my feeling getting in that uh, yeah. aircraft was so, it's so different. It's hard, hard to explain. It seemed so uh, more, op- more, more open and, and the aircraft, the size that wasn't that, seemed that large to me at that, that time. It might be because the ones that you flew in were loaded with bombs and, well, uh, <laughs> and munitions. <laughs> Maybe there were so many aircraft around that it, it seemed like it was... Well, the, when you see the B-17 in the hangar downstairs, it, yeah. it appears large to me, too, but I think because you're in a confined space. But then space. when you go over to the uh, hangar for North Korea or yes. the Korean Wars, yeah. And the Vietnam War, and you look at the at some of the aircraft over there, and know that they carry five or six times as much. Right. And they're and they're huge. You can't you can't really get Phantom. your yeah. can't yes. get your mind around those things. Yeah. And some of the capabilities they have, it's just absolutely amazing. Yes. Yeah. Is is this your first visit to the Air Museum? Or no, the second. Second time. I brought him here about what I'm... Uh, yeah, and I would see, they would fly, the 17s would, a uh, oh. s- separate group would come into Florida. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, we, I went to visit it several times. I took uh, my older son, Brent. I think uh, when Sheila was in Camarillo, they had the same experience. They had a 17 there. We went to visit. Well, and he, being, he, heard, being, he heard, he heard it. We were seeing it in my backyard. He goes, that's a B-17. I go, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I called the little airport, Camarillo mm-hmm. Airport. And they go, yeah, one just landed. Like, he knew it. He I, heard I, it. Even in Florida, I could tell. They had had both the 24s and the 17. Yeah. Well, there's no, there's no mistaking a 17. Yes. Yeah. There's no yes. mistaking a C-47. Yes. There's no mistaking a P-51. Yeah. Right. I mean, you don't have, if you've been around aircraft, like you've been around mm-hmm. aircraft for the intensity and time that, of your life yes. that you were. You but, never forget that. But yeah. see, the aircraft when uh, I, we visited in uh, Florida was outside. Mm-hmm. I never felt right. that the size was that was that huge. And well, even both visits, I never, I never it's, had that feeling. It's until twice I was size downstairs. compared to a 737. <laughs> yes, <it laughs> Which you yes, probably flew to Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's been a great experience, and uh, I think uh, coming to the museum a couple months ago, I had never visited. I've been to Palm Springs many times and had never had the opportunity, but, oh, it's a great experience. No, when I, st- st- I stood next to the P-51, I said, this mm-hmm. damn thing looks large. I used to see it looking out the window, mm-hmm. and, it, you know, out there and didn't see <laughs> that <laughs> big. Yeah, you know, what the hell? And I'm up, up next to it, and I said, my God. It's you know a larger aircraft, but yeah. again, being being within this confined space, all the different aircraft in that area, even mm-hmm. the 17 inside, but outside seems probably a lot. I never felt that it was enormous in size, but for some reason it looks it looks larger. Well, it's interesting uh, interviewing veterans who have, in many instances, flown in these aircraft, and. Um, what their reaction is to it in, as compared to their recollections of what it was. Uh, it's got to be a lot different. And I think 
my perception is that when people walk in, like yourself, walk into this museum, it opens a part of the book that you read a long time ago. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a totally different feeling. And the uh, openness that suddenly occurs, the, the ability to talk about it, um, is, is just presented I, I, to you. I, I never felt confined yeah. in that aircraft. We would get together all in the radio room on takeoff, and I look back and I say, holy crap. You know, it looks, it looks, I don't know how we did it, yeah. but I never felt, I felt very comfortable moving in that aircraft. Yeah, you never felt, the, never felt the claustrophobia. No, that, never, never had that feeling at all, never. I, my, my recollection of my first trip through this B-17 was, this is really teeny and tight. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and you look at other branches of the military and you think about the men that work on su inside submarines mm -hmm. and, you know, how, yeah. how they handle that, you know, yeah. that sort of well, feeling that's, of enclosed. That's, that's fascinating. It, it's just been an absolute pleasure talking with you. And before... Before we wrap this up, uh, you're the kind of person that I would guess has good advice to give to the present generation. And if you had the opportunity to talk to the present generation, what would you tell them based on your experiences in the military and in, and in your life? Well, I think take, don't take things for granted. I think uh, focus on your experience and make sure you learn something when you when you deal with the different things you deal with, but deal deal with your problems in an intelligent and smart way, and uh, and also expect things not to be uh, uh, something that you assume will work out okay. Expect the unexpected, and then deal with the problem. Don't don't uh, take time. Think about it, and I think. Uh, uh, be able to think and re make a smart decision about things you do. You're going to make mistakes, but learn. Learn from the mistakes mm -hmm. and then uh, take a positive view about things that happen in your life and then get smart about things. Educate yourself to the best level you can. Some people you can't, it's not possible, but uh, uh, all people don't have degrees. They have technical background, experience backgrounds. And some, I've met some people in my life that are smarter than guys with three degrees because they know how to learn from their experience and, 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 and learn in the process and get smart. And uh, don't take things for granted and uh, be, uh, be able to cope. Most of your life is dealing with people. But I think today, the world's today, they deal with messages that they relate to in communication in a different way and they don't do a one-on-one -on -one with people enough to learn and, and respect other people and what they do. And being able to uh, learn to have respect for other what other people do in their life, the fact that maybe they're not as educated as maybe you are, but respect and, and uh, learn from them about what they have to do to make a living. And, uh, and making that living isn't easy all the time, but do the best you can and uh, don't feel that uh, the world has uh, been tough on you, but uh, you, you live the best life you can and, uh, and be happy. And that's uh, the thing that you have to try to work towards. Frank, <laughs> that is the best definition I have ever heard of the Judeo-Christian principle of linear logic. <laughs> you learn from your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes, yeah. very important. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sheila, for joining us today. Yes. Uh, lucky girl to, I feel to have blessed. to have a dad. That, well, I feel uh, blessed I can spend this time with him now. Yeah, and that's and that he that, has such great memory and in, in, and can relate. In, incredible opportunity. Yeah. Yes, yeah. she's a wonderful woman. <laughs> of course she is. Thank you, she's Jim. Your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> well, my my pleasure completely. Good meeting you, Jim. Yeah. <laughs>
Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA From the lakes of Minnesota To the hills of Tennessee Across the plains of Texas From sea to shining sea From Detroit down to Houston And New York to L.A. Where there's pride in every American heart And it's time we stand and say That I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the man Defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men Defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I 